I am Gian, the founding pastor of Victory Church, and today the message is God loves all countries. This is our worship service number 279 since the day that we started this church, and today's date is February 27, 2022. I invite you to go to our website, vchurch.us, and download the bulletin in the tab, Bulletins, or simply if you are watching through a big TV in the comfort of your home, what if you grab your phone, point the camera towards the QR code, and voila, you have there the bulletin of today's teaching. I want to thank you for your support. It is wonderful that you, beautiful church members, are helping us, and anyone who wants to help this ministry, you can do it by going to the website, vchurch.us forward slash give. For those who are here in America that want to do it quickly, 432-268-0007 is the number that you can text, indicate the amount, and the system will take you through. Thank you, beautiful church members, for your support. You know that without you, we can do it. What we do, thank you, Sebastian, for your work with all the broadcast and IT, and thank you, Tracy, for the beautiful songs today. We are going to talk about God loves all countries. And it is precisely for that reason that Tracy and I are wearing this special outfit. This outfit comes from India. And then we are honored that we can connect with people from India and tell you that the Lord God loves you and loves everybody in all countries because that is his heart. His heart filled with love and compassion for everybody. So let me ask you a couple of questions here. Where can we find a believable source of the origins of the solar system, the universe, and humankind on earth? Where can we find that source? Or where can we find an organized explanation of the beginning of different races on earth that makes sense? Do you know? Where can we find an answer to our deepest curiosity about God, life, death, the past, present, and the future of humans? Do you know that? The Bible compiles several manuscripts that unequivocally respond to those questions and amazingly unite the facts and details of what happened before us. <laughs> the Bible registered proclaimed prophecies that came true to demonstrate the veracity of the writings and the power of the true God. The Bible also announced the hope for God's creation and invites us to take a step forward to become closer to the King of the universe. The Bible tells us numerous times how much the Lord God loves us and wants us with Him eternally in heaven. That is why, to explain how much God loves all countries, I begin my presentation quoting the scripture on Genesis 1.27. And we read in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. God created mankind in His own image. In the image of God, He created them. Male and female, He created them. Genesis 1.27. In Genesis 2.15, we read, The Lord God took the man, Adam, and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. Genesis 2.21. The Lord God caused Adam to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of his ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Genesis 2.22. Then the Lord God made Eve from the rib he had taken out of Adam, and he brought Eve to Adam. Adam and Eve is the beginning of all humankind. The Bible explains all that. From the beginning, we find in the book of Genesis chapter 1, all the way through, explanation and details of how the Lord made us, how He made the solar system, the universe, 
the different kingdoms, the mineral kingdom, the animal kingdom, and of course, of course, humankind. And also we know through the story of Adam and Eve that uh, they failed. They were, they were kicked out of the Garden of Eden. And as a result of that, because there was sin, it was needed eventually that somebody could come to rescue us, the Lord Jesus. But what we find in the description of Genesis from the chapter one, two, and forward is what happened with different races. How is it possible that through the years, through the multiplication of Adam and Eve, different generations and generations and generations, eventually they were finding places to, to live and habitate. And eventually they connect with each other to create different races, different characteristics of humans. Nations, tribes, and families. They are all interconnected because all begins actually with a family. You know, a family like you see today, wherever you live, you see a family and they probably are just husband and wife. Eventually there is a kid or maybe more than one. And then you see more kids and then you see other relatives, siblings, nephews, nieces. And eventually you see all this group of people and there are no places available in the neighborhood to park because the family got together and now they are a tribe. Well, tribes exactly like that eventually became nations. And how is it that people wonder about the origin of themselves without reading the Bible? The Bible explains that very detailed oriented and I love that about God. But now from the beginning, we find that there is a fight, a constant fight between good and evil. <laughs> you know what is interesting? That fight persists until today. Sometime, sometimes that fight is inside of you. Sometimes that fight is the good things you want to do against the bad things you want to do. And there is a constant battle there. But that battle between good and evil, of course, is not just inside of you. It is not just about you or <laughs> problems you can have with some people. It's a universal and universal problem in the whole wide world throughout the history of humankind. There are people you know that they are tender, they, they are nice, and uh, perhaps uh, they have a good heart. And we call those people that they have a good nature. But on the other hand, sometimes you see individuals that clearly from the beginning, they don't have a good nature. It seems like they are evil from the beginning to start. Do you know anyone <laughs> like that? Well, it just happens. And they are in every family, in every tribe, in every tribe, and of course, in every nation. It's the constant battle between good nature and evil nature. Now, you might be thinking, well, how is that the good Lord deals with both individuals, both kinds? Because honestly, if you think about good nature people and evil nature people, you personally, it will be an injustice if you treat them both the same because their natures are different. The good Lord treats them similarly, but differently. So I'm going to discuss with you today some of the actions and I will say procedures, ways that the Lord follows in order to deal with good nature people. You know, like a father, like a tender mother, like a great mentor, like someone that really cares. He has steps to follow when it's about dealing with people with which uh, 
have a good nature. And the first thing with good natured people, because the Lord sees if that person has a good nature. Well, the first thing he does is he starts to transfer some vision to the heart of this person. A vision, ideas. It's in your heart. If you are a good natured pe person, you know, from the beginning, since you were a child, you start to get these dreams, this vision. It is like a plan, and you don't know where that comes from. But good natured people have that. It's like the desire of accomplishing something. That is how the Lord begins his treatment with good natured people. He imparts a good vision to you. But with the vision, he will give you parameters. Parameters that will allow you to understand the limits. How far you can go doing this and how far you can go doing that. Because although you might be a person with a good nature, still you can do certain things that are not right. So the Lord will warn you and he will give you those parameters and he will say, these are your boundaries. But because you're a good natured person, you carry the vision, you understand the parameters. So now the Lord God will empower you in order to accomplish that vision. Which means somehow the Lord will provide means to you to accomplish that plan. He will provide, for example, the right people to be there near you to guide you. He will provide the proper training. He will provide all the material things that you will need, the financial things that you will need in order to accomplish that vision, that plan. But that's not all. Because with it, the Lord will provide for you a good supervisor to your life. That is the role of a mentor. You become a protege to somebody or several somebodies. Your parents, perhaps, somebody that you respect highly, or even in the workplace or in the school place. And good natured people understand the value of a, of a supervisor. Good natured people understand that having a protege, it's a privilege. It is a big blessing. Good natured people understand that that relationship with your supervisor, mentor, your leader, that person that is guiding you through life, it's a vital relationship for your future. As you go in life, go through life with all the obstacles that you can find, understanding the parameters you have, empowered by God, and you accomplish one at a time those steps in that vision the Lord God has for you. And while you are going through all that, you will learn the importance of the next generation. Because good nature people always are thinking, well, who is going to take over when I am gone? Who is going to do this? And not just that. Good nature people are thinking, the next generations need to learn things. They need training. They need resources. Good nature people are not selfish. They are thinking of everybody else, but particularly next generation. Through the process with good nature people, of course, you will see how the good Lord through those parameters will stop you from doing what is wrong. But you, because you are a good nature person, you become reasonable. And by being accountable to a, to a mentor, leaders, or authorities in your life, you will do good in life. With your ups and downs, totally trusting in God. Now, what about those who have an evil nature? You are wondering, right? <laughs> well, unfortunately for those who are uh, like that, if that is your case, you know, you had that evil nature since you were little. 
So in your homes, in your parents' home, <laughs> they knew that, that you were difficult, that your nature was an evil nature. So what is the first thing that the Lord will do with people with evil nature? Correction. And here's where everything begins for the evil nature person. Correction and correction and correction, telling them, no, you don't do this. No, you don't do that. No, this is the right way to do it, and correcting and correcting and correcting. Is that it? No, of course not. There is a need for enforcing rules with you, because although you already have been corrected, and you already know, know the rules, you just don't want to obey them. You don't want to follow the procedure. So they enforce rules in you. The good Lord will do that. And of course, that is based on the strict parameters. You know, there are not just simple parameters for you. If you are a person with an evil nature, the parameters are going to be very strict because all that the good Lord will try to do with you is to, to keep you on track. And that is why you receive warning after warning. Warning after warning. No, you, you are just doing it wrong. You are doing it wrong. You're going to lose this. You're going to lose that. You're going to get in trouble, in trouble, in trouble. No, the warning is not enough. Then is when the strong correction takes place. Evil nature people, sometimes they have to go to the extent of a final punishment, which means whatever it means for everyone. Some people with evil nature, they have to lose everything, not just possessions and positions, but also freedom, health, and finally life, because, th because they don't want to correct the path. They don't want to do things right. Evil nature people, unfortunately, they have to go through all that because the, the hope the Lord has for you, if you are a person with, a, with an evil nature, is that you will repent at some point. And you know, through history, we see that nations with good nature and nations with an evil nature. And we know the result. The outcome of that lifestyle is terrible. Can we change? Because regardless if you are a person with a good nature or an evil nature, there are changes. Can we change? Is it possible to change? When you are thinking about what's going on with your life and you see the result in your life of whatever is what you are doing, and you see what is happening with your health. You see what is happening with your finances. You see what is going on in your family, in your workplace, with your business. You see what is going on with your life. And you know it's not going well. The question is, can we change? Is it possible to change? Of course it's possible. But I want to now interact with you, inviting you for our next Sunday worship service 280 on March 6th. The title is God Loves You. God Loves You is a beautiful teaching that I want to share with you the following Sunday here in Victory Church. Okay, so let's talk about changing. Changing as a concept is ideal. But let's go back to the principles in the scripture, the principles in the Bible that will help us to correct the path. So what is the number one commandment? Do you know? The number one commandment is to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your strength, all of your mind, with all of your power. Love the Lord your God. Do you love God? Do you know God? Are you close to the good Lord? You see, when we are not even familiar with God, with the Word of God, the Bible, and we don't understand what the Bible is talking about, 
and we don't know how wonderful the Lord God is. There is no way to understand the first commandment. Loving the Lord our God with all of our heart, with all of our strength, with all of our minds. And, and as a result of that is that there, there is a lot of issues in your life. You know, if you don't love the Lord your God, if, if you are responding to the first commandment in the wrong way, probably you are doing two things. The number one thing you will do when you are failing to the first commandment is that you are practicing idolatry. What is that? Idolatry is when you have something or somebody in a pedestal, in a throne in your heart, and you consider that thing or that person the most important in your life. Rather than having the Lord God Almighty in your heart as the number one, you decided to put somebody or something. Somebody like a relative, father, mother, uncle, aunt, brother, sister, spouse, children, grandchildren, leaders, just another human being. People that are successful in life, in any field, whether it's in business or arts, politics, finances, it doesn't matter. You decided to put this particular person in the throne of your heart. It's a pedestal, you see? The number one person there, and you did it. You know what is interesting? Sometimes, what you are putting there in this, in this pedestal, in the throne of your heart, is nobody else but you. Where what matters to you is what you want, not what God wants or what is convenient for the rest. You totally disregard that. When you do not love the Lord your God with all of your heart, the first thing you will do is you will start practicing idolatry. And that's a terrible sin. And the second thing, of course, is you are going to be disloyal to the Lord God. Disloyal because you are not able to even say, thank you, Lord, for another day of life. You don't say, thank you, God, for what you are giving me. You don't recognize God in your endeavors. You consider that the one that is making you smart, making you strong, making you rich, making you handsome, making you whatever, is yourself. Or whichever is the idol you have in the throne of your heart. Basically, you are disloyal to, to the Lord God. Are you one of those? Or Really, the Lord God is your number one in your heart. How can you tell? Because people say easily, no, 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 no. For me, God is my number one. How can you tell? Because when you love the Lord your God, you show it with your actions. It's how you use your time in reference to the Lord God. In other words, how much time do you devote, dedicate to the Lord God? By reading the Bible, by saying your prayers, time invested in worshiping God. People say, I worship God from my home. We worship God here by watching, and I agree, occasionally it's acceptable. But it's not acceptable in the eyes of God that you will just stay in your home watching. According with your views, you are taking care of your health or whatever other things that are convenient for you. But in the eyes of the Lord, you are just being disloyal. Because you don't want to make the effort to come to a place of worship with other believers. And be together in worship to the good Lord God Almighty, King of the universe. 
That is how you know. And of course, you can tell through two more actions. One is very simple, it's about your giving. How much money are you giving to the cause of the kingdom of God? Simple. That tells you right there. If you give nothing, that tells you. For you, God is irrelevant. And the, and the third thing, which I know is another action, is acts of service in your local church. Is where they need you. Wherever you are watching, there is a local church. You need to be part of that local church and find ways to connect with them and serve in that local church. The pastor will tell you what is needed. The pastor will tell you. Now, what is the second commandment? Do you know that? The second commandment is similarly. The Lord Jesus said, you need to love your neighbor as you love yourself. Which, this is a big misinterpretation where people think that what matters is that I put others before me. <laughs> that is not like that, really. What is, what is expected of you in reference to the second commandment? The number, the number one thing expected is that you will respect the Lord. How? How is it that loving your neighbor as loving yourself implies res respect to the Lord God because you fear him? Because you fear him, you're not going to do anything wrong to yourself. And of course, you are not going to do anything wrong to anybody. You have a high respect to the Lord. You respect God. And you say, I'm not going to do this to myself. But it's also expected that you will respect everyone else. And here's the deal. When we have so many nations in the world, so many background cultures, and people don't want to respect the rest because they dress differently or their skin color is different, their eyes are not this color or their height is not this height or their language is not this particular language. Even when everyone has a different belief system, a different religion, respect is essential. It is not up to you to decide what others believe. But you need to respect everyone's beliefs. If somebody wants to believe this, it is his problem. If somebody else wants to believe that, it is his problem. Respect is that. Accepting that everyone has his own view. We here in Victory Church, as a Christian church, we promote the Bible. We promote the values of the Holy Scripture. We here exalt the name of Jesus and proclaim that he is the king. But we do it with all respect to all nations. But it's our duty as, a, as respecting God. And, and because we love everybody, we share the news about Jesus. And it's up to you if you want to receive that gift of salvation. Do you know that the Lord Jesus died for everyone? Some people don't even know that the Lord Jesus was Jewish. They didn't know that. But those who know that the Lord Jesus was Jewish, they have to understand that he died not just for the Jews, also for the Gentiles. And who are the Gentiles? Gentiles are, from the biblical standpoint, anyone that is not Jewish. In other words, from other nations, other than Israel, from other nationalities. The Lord Jesus died for Jews, and also he died for the Gentiles. But the Lord Jesus also died for people from all religions and nationalities. The Lord Jesus died for everyone. He, he was not going through the path of Calvary, getting ready to die, thinking, well, 
I'm glad I'm doing this because my Jew fellows. No, he said, I'm glad that I'm doing this because of everybody. Because he died for everybody in the world. Those who lived in the past, present, and future. All nationalities. In America, Latin America, in Europe, in Asia, Africa, Australia. Everywhere in the world. The Lord Jesus did it for everybody. Do you know that he has risen? The Lord Jesus is the resurrected king. That is the big difference, my friend, in all religions, in all belief systems. Because there are many belief systems, many big religions all over the world. And they, in those groups, they have a leader, a founder, somebody that came up with the ideas. And many of those religions are looking for peace and harmony. With a few exemptions of radicals, as we know. But one thing that is a big difference between us Christians and the rest is that our leader, the one that we worship, has risen. He is alive. He's back alive after the third day of his death. He has risen. He is the resurrected king. That is the big difference. There is no other person that has been, is, or will be on earth that will do such a thing. There is nobody else. The only one in the whole history of humankind, there is no records of anyone else that has or does something like that. The Lord Jesus is the only one who died and also came back to life. He is the resurrected King. So let me share with you one passage in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. After his resurrection, Jesus came to his disciples and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. All nations. Jesus loves all nations. His desire is to bring them to heaven to enjoy eternal life. The Lord God loves all nations. Whether you believe or not, whether you are here in this part of the continent, you are in North America or South America or Central America, in the Caribbean, or you are in Asia, you are in the Pacific Islands area, in Oceania, in Australia, in Europe. It doesn't matter which part of Africa you are. It doesn't matter. He died for everybody because Jesus loves all nations. And his desire is to bring them to heaven, to enjoy eternal life. And that is what Christianity is all about. That he died for you. So you can enjoy eternal life in heaven. And of course, that is very hard to compre comprehend for some people because they have been taught that there are different other ideas uh, like reincarnation or simply when you die, you cease to exist and that's it. But people ignore that. That's why we are here today to tell you that the Lord God loves all nations. And he gave the life of Jesus 
to save you. He gave the life of His Son to rescue you. Do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, my friend? Can you believe such a thing? That there was one person that gave his life for you. Only the Holy Spirit can do that job in your heart. Do you know that? Only the power of the Holy Spirit can do that in you. But the Holy Spirit is touching your heart right now. The Holy Spirit is touching your heart, moving you to believe, and it's up to you. You can open that heart of yours and receive that faith to believe that Jesus is the Son of God, or you can say, no. What are you going to do? What about eternity in heaven? Not just for you, but everybody in your family. And there are no conditions other than believing. That's the only requirement, to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. I pray that you open your heart, my friend, right now to receive the salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share with you another important thing about Jesus is that when He died, He also paid the price for your healing. So today I want to pray for you so you will, you will receive healing in your life. You will receive healing, physical healing, mental healing. And I know that sometimes it's hard to, to even process that the Lord God can come down to earth, to you, to wherever you are watching and listening, believing that the miracle can happen. Well, I tell you this, the miracle is happening. If you are a person that is struggling greatly with tremendous back pain, Receive your healing right now, my friend. If you are the person that is struggling greatly here in your neck with pain and you just can't take it anymore, receive your healing right now. If you have issues with your organs, receive your healing right now. Your pancreas, your liver, your stomach, your intestines, any organ, even your heart can be healed. If you are hoping for a miracle in a child, right there with you, that child is being healed as well. That child receives right now the healing in the name of Jesus. Because the Lord God has that power. Believe to receive your miracle. Believe to receive the touch of the Holy Spirit in your life. The Lord can heal you. Anything and everything. There is nothing impossible for Him. You just receive that healing. Lift up your hands. Lift up your hands, wherever you are, and just say, Dear God, touch me now. Say it. Dear God, touch me. Touch me. Heal me. And you will feel the heat of the Holy Spirit touching you. And you are being healed. In the name of Jesus, you can, and you are, and you will. And all that is because of the great mercy of God by sending His Son, Jesus. So I encourage you today, based on this scripture in the Gospel of John, chapter 3, 16, the Lord God loved the world so much that He gave, he gave His only Son so that everyone who believes in Him will not be lost, but have eternal life. Say these words with me if you believe. Dear God, please forgive me for my sins. I believe 
that Jesus is your son. I believe that Jesus died for me and he has risen. He is alive. And I believe that your Holy Spirit is in my heart now, giving me eternal life. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you so much for connecting with us. Send us an email, info at thechurch.us. Go to our website and connect with us. I'll be happy to hear from you. Remember this message is, God loves all countries. From Odessa, Texas, I say to you, thank you so much for being here with us. Share this message with someone that needs to hear it. And uh, in the name of the Lord God Almighty, in the name of my church, Victory Church, and in the name of my own family, my wife, Tracy, and my team, we say to you, have a wonderful rest of your day. See you next time. Hey, 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 hey. That's all, that's all, that's all, folks. <laughs> Time to go home. <laughs> Ciao. By Giancarlo Vicitoro. I know you have suffered. But what if you would have never met your mom because she died giving birth to you? That's the beginning of Simon's story. Then Simon's father died when he was only 15 years old. He was sent to a foster home where he was bullied, humiliated, and there was no one to protect him. But Simon decided to find a way to get his revenge by studying and becoming good at sports. He won a scholarship, and soon he started his own business, Simon Yardwork. Mean people were envious of his success, but one day, Simon met and fell in love with Jackie. They were happy, until the FBI arrested Simon due to clues that incriminated him with several murdered people. Will Simon end up in prison? Don't miss the outcome of this story, The Best Revenge, the musical that will inspire everyone to pay good for evil. Go to mygiancarlo.com to purchase The Best Revenge on audio and video.